Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second lecture in the series of three of Indian philosophy, faith, and yoga. I'm taking the opportunity on behalf of India Student Association to introduce Sri Madhav P. Pandit. Those who couldn't attend last night's lecture, I'd like to say some few words about him. He is the secretary in C. Aravind Ashram, Pandicherry in South India. He is also the chairman, World Union International. He has written or edited more than 80 books, is that correct, on this subject of yoga and philosophy. He is also an exponent of Indian philosophy and yoga. Some of the books are in display here for the interested viewers who can look and have a look at it. And if you like to have a copy, you can contact Dr. Manjit Misra, or he has written some, I think, distributor's address down here. Mr. Pondit has expressed his willingness to accept questions from the audience after the talk. So the floor will be open for discussion when the talk will be over. I have another announcement to make. Tomorrow, from 1.30 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon, there will be an informal meeting at Dr. Mistress' residence. Those who like to have a chat with Mr. Pandit are cordially welcome. Here is the direction and address how to get there. Today, Mr. Pandit will talk on the art of living. Tomorrow, his talk will be on art of dying at the same time here at 8 o'clock in the evening. Now, please join me to welcome Mr. Pandit. Mr. Pandit? full, this is full. The full is taken out of the full. Take out the full from the full, the full remains. This is the logic of the infinite. Our world this creation has come out of the plenitude of the being of a divine reality. Out of bliss, all things are born, says an ancient text. By bliss they are maintained, and into bliss they pass. Who indeed could live, could breathe, but for this ether 
of delight that pervades this universe, drawing attention to this profound observation of an ancient text called the Upanishad, Sri Aurobindo asks in his life divine, his main metaphysic, then how is it if life has issued out of bliss, if there is a fundamental delight of existence underlying all creation. Why? Why is it that we meet with so much of pain, so much of suffering, so much of evil in our day-to-day -day life? And he answers, it is because we have lost the art of life. And a true art of living depends upon the aim of life. An aimless life, the mother points out, is a miserable life. And to have an aim in life, the right aim of life, it depends upon what view you take of life. Broadly speaking, there are three world views. There is a view which insists that the reality of things, the ultimate truth of things, is beyond, beyond the cosmos. It is called the a cosmic view insisting that the reality is there. The earlier we withdraw, the better for all of us. It devalues life on earth. There is an opposite view, what we may call the terrestrial view, which says that all life, all meaning, all purpose is here. There is nothing before, there is nothing after. Make the best of the opportunity that you have. Enjoy life. This leads to what is called hedonism. Drawing the best, what they call the best of life. Sensationalism. There is another view, which is very popular among religions, and that is what we may call the supraterrestrial view. It conceives of this universe as a series of worlds. This earth is only a kind of an annex, and there are worlds above. There are the heavens, the paradises, and the hills, and other worlds. And this earthly life is only a preparation, an introduction to the greater life to follow. Real life, they say, is after you die. And the quality of life that you will have depends upon what you do here, what kind of life you lead, what kind of religion you practice, what kind of God you worship, what kind of belief you hold to. This is called the supraterrestrial view. Ultimately, this also looks down upon this life before us. The view that I am putting forward before you, the tradition of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, which I represent here, reconciles all these three views and insists upon giving a full premium, full value to life on earth here. It accepts the cosmic view because it says the origin of this universe, 
The source of our existence is there in the transcendent reality. There are a number of worlds in this cosmos. We form part of a system of worlds. It is a cosmos, an orderly universe. And there are a number of worlds, there are a number of planes of existence, and ours is the material plane. And this world is the center of the field of this entire manifestation. It is the field of an evolution of a divine consciousness. It is the field of the birth of God. The real meaning of life, asserts this philosophy, is that it is a field for the manifestation of a God consciousness of a divine reality. And this reality, this consciousness, manifests itself as knowledge in the mind, as love in the heart, in the soul, as power in the life dynamism, as beauty in the physical. So all the real aim of life is to build these four values of God, beauty, power, love, knowledge in our life. That is to unveil the glory of God on earth, organize our life in terms of these four supreme values. Not man, the mind alone, not man, the heart alone, not man, the vital dynamism alone, as Bergson would have it, Alan Vital, nor man, the physical man alone, but the entire man, the integral man, the total man, is what is the purpose of life, a plenary manifestation, a plenary organization in which all the levels of life are properly organized, coordinated, integrated with each other. That's the picture, that's the perfect life. So as I was saying elsewhere, the aim of life is not salvation, salvation into the beyond, but it is fulfillment. Fulfillment of a purpose of God on earth in our life. And that fulfillment is perfection of life. Perfection of life. Perfect man in a perfect society. The concern of old spirituality of institutional religions has been severely individual. But a time has come when the individual concern has got to be enlarged and extended into a universal concern. It is not only the individual who is to be perfected, who is to be made happy, but also the society, the collectivity both the individual and the collectivity are two terms of the manifestation of one divine consciousness. One on a universal scale and one in an individual scheme. The microcosm and the macrocosm are two statements, self-affirmations of the reality. And how do we get about it? <coughs> We don't need to retire to hermitages, to mountain tops, to monasteries, to cloisters, but we have to build God in our life day to day. The quality of my life is measured not by my thoughts, 
by my prayers in my prayer room, but in my day-to-day -day dealings with my fellow men, the way I respond to stimulations of life outside, and any scheme for the perfection of life, to draw the full meaning of life, to make the best of the opportunity that life presents to me, starts where I am, at whatever stage. And as most of us do, we start on a physical level. We are bound in a physical body, deal in physical, on a physical plane, have physical values. And the first spiritual truth that we have to accept is that there is a divine consciousness pervading, inhabiting all material things. If soul, if the spirit is the soul of matter, matter is the robe of the spirit. We have, in one of our ancient texts again, a saying which has not drawn enough attention, even in India, and that is Annam Brahma. Matter is Brahman. Matter is God. Writing on this statement, more than 60 to 70 years ago, Sri Aurobindo, my teacher, wrote that India, we in the East, have ignored this dictum of God, that there is God in matter. The West has listened to this call, worshipped God in matter, and has reaped the bounty of the blessings of God in matter. They have reaped the riches of material civilization and opulence. We have impoverished ourselves Maybe we in the East have heaped the treasures of the spirit, but we have impoverished ourselves on the material level. The West, it should be set to its credit, to the Western mind, to the Western genius, that they have extracted, they have exploited, they have brought out the optimum from matter. It is God, it is a divine energy and consciousness that is in matter, that is being processed and brought about. And it is something to be proud of, not ashamed of. It is a wrong gospel. It is a false gospel, which says that technology is a curse, that technology is a burden, and that we have to go back to nature. There is no going back. The law of evolution in which you and I are caught, whether we like it or not, is from simple to the complex. Ask Teya Shardai and he will tell you how. Complexity of consciousness is the law and nobody can escape. You can't go back to simplicity. The whole moment of nature is towards more and more variety, more and more complexity. The art is to discover the source of unity, the source of harmony among all this diversity. As I was saying, we recognize that there is a spirit, that there is a consciousness in all matter, in everything. And it is a measure of our growth, of our development of sensitivity and articulation of consciousness that we recognize, regard, and respond to consciousness in material things. We should build the material life in the proper and a growing sense of beauty. The ancient Greeks had a perception of this truth of life and they perceived beauty. Aesthesis, they built a regular science of physical aesthesis, beauty of form, 
and what is beauty in form translates itself as rhythm in movement. Perhaps that was one of the secrets of the of Olympics, beauty of human form and rhythm in movement. We have to make it part of our education. Education for children, education for adults, adult education also, to introduce these values of beauty, of rhythm in our dress, in our organization, in our arrangement of things, a certain elegance, a certain aesthetic value, because ultimately the mind is influenced by what it constantly sees. If it is constantly exposed to ugliness, disorder, uncouth, unslovenliness, the thoughts also move in that groove. Accustom a young and impressionable mind to an environment where beauty is organized, where beauty is natural, splendor, brightness, the thoughts also tend in that direction. We have got into a wrong habit of putting a premium on ugliness, on and barrenness, on ascetic barrenness, on something disorderly, and we think it is something wonderful. It is not. It is a core of the core of the adversary, which makes us delight in ugliness, which makes us put down like vandals all that is beautiful, all that is splendorous, all that is harmonious. We have to build our material and physical life in terms of sensitivity, recognition of consciousness, beauty, elegance, rhythm. And in this respect, the West has gained a march on the East. Each time I come 10,000 miles from the east, I am struck. Even in the poorest American home, there is a sense of order. There is a sense of system, cleanliness, elegance. I bow down in myself to this spirit of the Western mind, the American soul, which has instinctively reared these values. They may not be very conscious why they are doing, but it is an expression of a divine urge to express God as beauty, as order, as elegance. It is a natural aesthesis. You have only to go to the east, you have only to go beyond the Suez Canal, beyond the Atlantic to see. Why we are struck by this achievement, technological civilization of yours? It is a part of the spiritual efflorescence of humanity that science should go forward, that technology must develop. Only we have to add a new dimension. That is, we must have that moral, spiritual control, direction to use this technology for the purpose for which it is meant and not allow ourselves to be used by the force of technology. So, whether in education, culture, in other paraphernalia of civilization, we have to pay due attention to order, system, the right use of things, not to waste things. This is the one defect I have seen in this country, and that is there is a colossal waste. Colossal waste at every level. Food, clothing, papers. When New York Times, 90 pages, I am told somebody has calculated each issue means so many acres of forests being used up. And who the hell reads these pages? I have seen people don't have time even to open the sheets. We are visitors, we have no other work except certain giving lectures and we can afford to turn the pages. And so much of waste, why? 
If I open a paper in India, in five minutes I know all the world news. There are eight pages. And each one knows where to find what. In, eight, in five minutes we know entire world events. Here I have to search and search. It is as if the world does not exist. It is only particular parts of America that exist. And all the frontline news are disproportionately exposed. But that's another matter. But what I was saying, there is so much of colossal waste. Waste of time, waste of energy, waste of material. But this is a thing for which, unless we are careful, we have to pay one day. Nature will visit its nemesis unless the collective consciousness of American humanity wakes up in time and conserves. And I'm extremely happy and grateful to God that I have seen this sign right from Oregon, where I was there three months ago on a lecturing tour, how the young people are seized with this movement of conservation, of avoiding energies. They are forming small clubs where they collect things, where they pool things, make the right use of things. And I met the other last week, I was in Florida, and I met in Pensacola also the spirit. There is a new organization called the Spirit of Pensacola, started by young people. Also, unknown to them, this is to conserve things, to save things. So there is something that is informing the national soul that a time has come when we have to conserve. All this energy crisis, oil crisis, all crises are things forced by nature on you to wake you up to the necessity of conserving your resources. And it is a part of the physical organization of life, physical perfection of life, to conserve, use largely, spend, eat, enjoy, but don't waste. Give liberally, eat whatever you can, but don't throw. It is something given by God. You have no idea how much we people have to suffer and work and strain ourselves for a little bit. You have no idea how many millions are there in our part of the world who don't have one square meal per day, who don't see rice even once a week, who don't have a roof over their heads. You do not appreciate the blessings of God in many matters. There are five people should complain here. Everybody says there is pulls a long face, and we are materialist people, we are doing like this, and we are not happy. These are all man-made ills. You don't need to be unhappy. You make yourself, it has become a fashion here to be pessimistic, to believe in the prophecies of Edward Casey, that there is a going to be a calamity, there is going to be earthquakes. All these, they are prophets of doom who have not perceived the truth. They may have perceived, I have an explanation, uh, but not at this moment, why they say like that. Now, as I was saying, the physical side, I have explained what part we have to do, what orient, new orientation we have to give to our approach to life. The second is our energies, vital energies, there is around us an immense reservoir of ocean of life energies and other energies. The food that we take can give us only a part of the energy that we need. If only we can tune ourselves to nature, keep ourselves open to the inflow of energies and forces from the universe. That we, we, we have an endless supply of energies. For that, we have to learn to work, work without tension, work with a creative joy, work not as a chore, not as a routine, not as something that has to be done, drudgery, 
but with a creative joy in it. And that is easy for those who believe that there is a God, that there is a divine reality, that there is a Lord, there is a master of works to whom all our energies flow. Each one of us, whatever is assignment, whatever is work, must look upon what work comes to him or her as something sacred, as something given by the divine reality, by the divine Lord, to pour our energies for the building of his kingdom on earth. And from that point of view, whether you are a shoe, shoe shine or a surgeon or a professor or a poet or an artist, it does not matter. What matters is the attitude, the spirit with which you do your work. And it is required that every work that you do, you offer it as a labor of love in a spirit of devotion to God. And once you offer it, the character of the work changes. You try to do as best as you can. You try to work not in order just to earn money or maintain yourselves, but because it is something that is offered to God, you try to do as best as you possible. And the true test whether you have really offered the work to God is that you don't claim the results of work. You accept, learn to accept with equanimity whatever results accrue to your work as coming from God, as the will of God. And when you have that attitude, work becomes a joyous occasion. It becomes a field for the injection of the new values the new elements of consciousness that you build in yourself. It is a part of spiritual discipline to enhance the value of life, enhance the value of work, to invest it with a sacred value. And that is to make your work an offering to God. My teacher, the mother used to say that work is the body's best prayer to the divine. When that is done. There is no fatigue. At the end of the day, there will be still a joyous, creative energy flowing through your veins, and you will not be fatigued. You will not be tired. Because you are not working for yourself. Apparently, yes, but really, no. You are working for something else. You look upon Whatever work comes to you as an assignment, whatever your circumstance of life, you don't grumble. You accept it as intended for your best evolution. And for a seeker who accepts his position as intended for his best evolution, things turn out to be that. And third is, in the heart, we, each one of us is a sea of mixed emotions. And the center of these positive emotions, positive qualities, is in the center of the heart, and that is love. Love is the greatest power in creation. And it is out of love that everything will be ultimately governed. The future leadership of the human race is going to go not to those who have greater knowledge, who have greater power, military or political power, but to those who can receive, radiate and embody greater and greater love. In the new age that is to come, love is going to be the prime power. And as far as our emotional life is concerned, we have to observe ourselves, undergo what is called a regular inner catharsis, inner purification of rejecting consistently 
every movement that smacks of darkness, every movement that smacks of limitation, and cultivate, promote movements that expand, that enlarge, that unite. Ego, desire, these are the springs of negative movements, of things that tend to limit us. Why, why am I afraid? Why am I nervous? Why am I tense? It is because I look upon myself as separate from you all, as exposed to others, what I call others. There is a universal life force pouring on me in waves. I shrink, I try to protect myself within the walls of my egoism, within the walls of my separate individuality, and I shrink, I limit myself. If I recognize that there is a self, there is a level at which I am one with you all, that this separativity is purely a surface egoistic separativity, that I am one with you at the level of matter, we are all formed of the same matter, I am one with you at the level of life force. We all breathe the same life force. I am one with you at the level of soul because all souls are sparks of one God. I am one with you at the level of mind because all individual minds are fragments of a universal mind. Where is the distinction? In truth, where am I separate from you all? So every movement that promotes unity, that promotes harmony, that promotes goodwill, that is spiritual, and that is integrative, that is positive. All the rest have to be discouraged, excised from our being. This is called the culture of emotions. All standards of morality, all cultural systems are designed to dispossess man of his animality and lead him on towards divinity. Every moment in our life, we are given a choice. People, philosophers, speak of free will, determinism and all that. But the truth is, every moment of our life, we have a free choice. Each moment, life offers me a choice, whether I choose the hard path of right and good and truth and proceed upwards or choose the lesser and the easier path of sliding downward, it is left to my will. You must be aware that there is an interesting discussion among certain sections of scientists today as to what is the fifth dimension. I'm sorry, what is the fourth dimension? They have said that, uh, yes, what is the fifth dimension? The, apart from the three normal dimensions, they have recognized that time is the fourth dimension. And they are speaking today of the fifth dimension. And the fifth dimension, they say, is the sense of freedom, the sense of free will to choose my next step whether I'm going to put my next step this way or that way, that is entirely left to me. And that is the fifth dimension. Each one has to learn to exercise this right in the proper and the right way. And the last is the mind. I said that the divine manifests as knowledge in the mind. I spoke in an earlier class in the morning how the primitive man starts with what is called a physical mind, a sense mind. All the senses go, take a cognizance of things outside, bring reports, and the mind works upon it. That's how the primitive man functions. As man develops, there is the th reasoning mind, the reasoning faculty forms. And for a long time, it is the reasoning mind. But the reasoning mind also is severely related to objective realities outside. 
after the time, there is the birth of the thinking mind. Thinking mind, where we think for thought's sake, not necessarily related to objective existences. So there is the thinking mind. And we are today at that level of the intellect of thought mind. But we are prisoners of thoughts. We don't think we are thought. If we just look at ourselves, we are see that there is a rush of thoughts, a, pass, a heavy trade of thoughts. So it is part of the art of life at the mental level to learn to regulate and control the mind, to arrest the flow of thoughts, to think what I want to think, not to think what I do not want to think, to keep my mind quiet, silent. And when I keep the mind silent, processes of meditation, processes of concentration, contemplation are all designed just for this, to silence the mind, to tune the mind to a state of calm, to a state of peace, to a state of quietude, where you become aware of a dimension of existence which is not helplessly involved in movements of nature, but where there is peace, where there is a certain immutability, where there is stability. And from there you observe you acquire control over nature. And when the mind is quiet, you open to the workings of higher faculties than the intellect. The faculty of intuition, which is the edge of truth, which is a flash of truth, exactly lighting on the solution that you want. Down the history, all major discoveries in the field of mathematics, in the field of scientific discoveries, have been achieved by a stroke of intuition. It is only afterwards that they have started organizing, rationally, rationalizing, and explaining in a logical way. There is inspiration where you hear the truth. Poets hear the truth. There is what you see the truth. Revelations, the artists, they see in vision what is going to happen. They see realities forming before they are precipitated in material terms. And there are uh, many more activities of consciousness to which the human mind is ready. And we have to learn to fashion our mind into a right reflector of knowledge and not just a seeker, a feverish seeker of knowledge. Mind is a reflector of knowledge. We have to learn to develop that. So you develop, organize the physical life, in terms of beauty and order, you organize your vital life in terms of unending energy and the right harnessing of your energies to a high purpose. You have systematic catharsis of the heart. Purify yourselves. Make yourself centers and dynamos of love, benevolence, compassion, unity, peace and the mind open to higher faculties than reason. And in all this, as your consciousness develops, as the quality of your life improves, there is a divine center. There is a soul. There is a self which is, doesn't die, which is a spark of God, which is the soul of conscience, which is the soul of wisdom, which begins to shine. At present, it is curtained by so many veils of ignorance of nature. As you reform nature, as you culture, as you purify yourself, the light of the soul begins to shine. The mind is quiet. The heart is not turbulent. And there is an instinctive guidance from within what is right and what is not right. There is a feeling of unity with everyone. There is a feeling of being supported from above. There is one God, there is one divine, there is one life, there is one consciousness, unity of life. And this, to, to whatever extent one succeeds, to that extent, 
One gives meaning to life. One imparts significance to life. Each day becomes an adventure. Each day you wake up, you have a program before you. How you push through this program of the culture of consciousness, organization of life, express more and more of God each day in your life. And that is to learn to do that is to learn the art of life. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, he's glad to answer. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, I read some stuff by Andrew Casey a while back, and I was wondering what do you think was the thing you got off the track? Edgar Casey. Yeah. Yes.